and here we are. Yeah. <laughs> and where I usually like to start is just with personal story, because you didn't get here just because you were on a linear path. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these things are childhood related in terms of passion, interest, mm -hmm. fixing, whatever. You know, it's the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. So, Brian, I'd like to start with you mm -hmm. and just talk about, you know, where all this began to start with you and your interest. I think, I mean, if I contextualize the work I'm fortunate to do now at Arena Labs and that we do, we call high performance medicine, but I would say I'm, I feel really really fortunate because it's the intersection of all the things I love. It's working in an industry that is full of service archetypes. So people who want to do hard things, impact the world and save lives. It's at the intersection of human performance and understanding how do we help people flourish and then of building great teams. Um, and so that confluence for me, I think, I mean, it, you know, in terms of origin story, I grew up in a household where my mom was a nurse and, you know, the story I was telling earlier, I, I have vivid memories of her at our kitchen table and she she loved what she did she was not an emotionally dramatic person but on the days where something went wrong in the operating room or she lost a patient i could viscerally feel that and as a kid i remember wondering what it was that she loved that you know when, when you're young you can't appreciate passion and mission but my mom clearly had that um and she was someone who gave of herself deeply to the craft that mm. she loved um and so that's one channel that, that that i'll come back to and then the second is that i was fortunate I'd always been interested in uh, learning and exploring, I, I think more through the, the intellectual mind, um, but I joined the military later in life. And for me, I was 30 years old when I finished training and it opened up for me despite being, you know, by more societal definitions, mature in terms of growth, it was uh, probably the single most impactful event for me. And, and one of the things about special opera operations training is that it it really helps you understand what's at the bottom of your own well and how to think about potential mm -hmm. differently. And it was a real gift for me. And then I became passionate about how do I not only cultivate that for myself and the people around me, but more at scale. Um, and so, you know, bringing all that when I got out of the military, this idea of building and creating teams, uh, I was really fortunate to meet a heart surgeon or, uh, as I was leaving the military. And I saw the shortfalls of healthcare, and it started to make sense for me why in those hmm. younger years, my mom yeah. was uh, grappling with what she loved. And, and so all of that has come together at Arena. And, and again, I think like, I feel really blessed to get to do work that for me is it's, it's part passion. It gets back to who I was and, and how I came to be, but also it, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to impact its scale when we do our work well. That's great. Mm -hmm. And then later, you and I are going to have a chance to really dive into the work and the mission of Arena, yeah. great. which I'm very passionate about. Mm -hmm. And Ryan, I'm going to shift to you here because you mentioned a little earlier about kind of a mid-course correction or refocus. But in your journey, um, where did this whole interest in peak performance health uh, start for you? Um, I guess it kind of goes back to uh, early childhood and just being in competitive sports all my life, been extremely competitive um, in whatever we've done. And we get that honestly through <laughs> both parents. Um, they were both great athletes. Uh, and you, and you kind of progress through life, right? And you kind of go through different cycles, uh, ups and downs. And, um, and then it probably started to hit me after my dad had a massive heart attack, had to have mm. uh, a triple bypass or needed a triple bypass. One was so damaged they could only do a double bypass. And then, you know, kind of looking around the room and seeing my kids and thinking, you know, I want to make different choices at that kind of midpoint in life than my father made to make sure that the years I have are quality and I could spend as much time with my kids as possible. So. Yeah, that was uh, 40 years old. I did my first marathon, and I hate to run. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done multiple <laughs> uh, ultras since then, the longest being 100K. And then that opened new doors, and that's the cool thing about, I think, being super curious is if you're willing to step through those doors, like unbelievable things can happen and new relationships and experiences. And, you know, five years later, uh, it's put me on this wild journey of health and fitness. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. What I really enjoy about all your stories is that you're bringing what you've experienced into a broader context, whether it's work or, or wherever. And for me, that's part of leadership is those lessons. Uh, you don't compartmentalize, mm -hmm. you know, you, you look at it holistically. And for you, Kristen, you've been 
a top performing collegiate athlete, a you know, a coach that, you know, few people have ever reached the status, but there was a little girl, Kristen, at one time, mm. <laughs> and uh, that drive came from someplace. Yeah. Well, I think at a really early age, I, I lived in Tennessee in a, a little town outside of Knoxville. And at the time, uh, Pat Summit was, you know, kind of early in her career. Yeah. And my dad used to bring me to their preseason games and their games. And I just remember being so enamored <laughs> with everything related to just that whole environment. Um, you know, Pat Summit, you know, I think goes without saying, you know, just one of the most arguably yeah. the most successful coach ever to, you know, walk the planet. Um, and just to see a woman, I think, you know, demand excellence, mm -hmm. you know, and have such high standards, but you could tell that she loved her players. And so I think just that visual at a young age kind of set me on a path where I was like, wow, I want to be a part of something like that. And I discovered teams, um, soccer teams and basketball teams and field hockey teams. And I just loved, loved being part of a team. You know, it just felt like uh, just a place where I could be myself. It just felt really natural to me. And, and I felt like it was the place where I could really maximize my potential as a human being, you know, because I, I think I realized at an early age that it was so much more than just the sport, like the technical and the tactical aspects. Like there was just you know, the potential to lead, um, the, to be led and to, to lose, to win. You know, there's just so many things happening over the course of, of a practice and a game and a season that just felt so alive to me. So I think I um, just really, I think the little girl, I, I think just loved being parts of, part of a team and yeah, just everything yeah. that came with that. Well, and that hero figure mm. that really sparked it. And, uh, you know, my growing up, I had one key influence, and that was Mr. Rubido. He was a former strategic air commander, eighth grade teacher. And one day he slammed me up against a locker and lifted me in the air. And I was all of 4'8 and 84 pounds and said, Miller, you've got too much going for you for me to see it go to waste. Now, that was back in the day where you could do that. And I <laughs> got paddled in <laughs> middle school. and But that changed my life because... Forever, I started asking the question, what is it that he sees that I don't see? Hmm. And then, uh, so let's, let's- Did you real quick, did you ever circle back to Mr. Rubidoux and Oh, yes, that? and he's in all my books. Oh, very you know, cool. he's part of, the, part of the story of my books. Yeah. So. Oh. Oh. So, the thing that impressed me the most is I got in trouble a lot. And so, because I just talked, so he would have this thing in class where you'd come in after and sit in study hall for an hour. And uh, if you, he'd say, Miller, 30 minutes. And I'd say, but, and he said, an hour. And so you'd stop saying anything. But when I was in there, parents would come back. Every, every time we were there, somebody came back with their kids and said, this is the man who changed my life. So... I watched that. Mm. Wow. So I've been, since that time, always looking up to people, seeing, you know, the special magic that they have and wondering, what's that magic that they mm. can produce? Yeah. So That's anyway, beautiful. sorry about That's that. That's awesome. awesome. No, I love you, it. That's you, a good life if you can make someone cry on memory, you know, know. seriously. It's, we all... Well, you hit me off, <clears throat> off balance, so, because I was, I was talking. And so, and all of us... I know have somebody that's inspired. Mm -hmm. That's why I go to that. Who, yeah, who yeah. was the person mm -hmm. who inspired you to yeah. go further? And then there was the bridge from kind of college. For some people, college was very formative. Mm -hmm. uh, for others, they got through it. But there was some point in time where you began your trajectory into what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. So what was that tipping point for you, Kristen? Yeah. Well, in college, I was playing two sports. I was playing field hockey and basketball at the University of Iowa. And then I was also playing on the U.S. national team. So I kind of had three things going on at once. So it was pretty busy, as you can yeah. imagine. Um, but I was always really interested in coaching. So after I made the U.S. national team, I think I was, I was 19, and I started coaching the U19 national team. And at 20, I became the head coach of the U19 national team. Wow. So I, 
and all, all that to say is I just mm-hmm. loved coaching. I loved being able to find that magic in, yeah. in a person and help them, you know, recognize their talents and their potential. And mm-hmm. um, so I just, I love that interaction. And so I think, I think for me, it was just, I had great coaches. Um, my collegiate coaches were sensational, um, all, all of them. Uh, so I was really lucky to have, uh, you know, my, my head coach was a three-time Olympian. I think between all three of my coaches, they probably had over 400 international caps, wow. which is a cap is an international match under their belt. So they just had incredible amounts of experience. And, you know, we're not just great technicians and tacticians, um, but they really were phenomenal leaders. And I think gave me uh, a blueprint really for what it means to lead others and, you um, and, and to really lead from a values uh, driven place. Um, mm. So I think that for me, I think college was really about, you know, finding my own motivation for, for why I'm doing the things that I'm doing and not being afraid to kind of dig into that. And, um, and I think as a result, I think I got a lot happier, you know, I was so outcome focused for so long. And then I, I started realizing that wow, okay, this is, I started understanding, I think, what it is that I really love about the game and about coaching. And, um, and I really started to lean into that. So I think for me, like, definitely my coaches were very Mm. much, you know, a a huge influence. Um, And then as I graduated from college, I started doing research in a lab. um, And this, I was taking master's classes, um, graduate classes um, in psychology, and I met a PhD student, uh, Dr. Molly Marty, now Dr. Molly Marty and Dr. Lockett Stewart and started working in their lab. So I was doing research and they were really interested in kind of understanding the physiology and the psychology. And that's where um, I, I think, you know, that's really what served as the foundation for kind of all the things that I'm doing today and all the things that I did as a coach in my career, you know, really integrating the physiology and the psychology mm-hmm. and giving mm-hmm. folks a blueprint, you know, to, to take some of the guesswork out of peak performance, I suppose, um, for lack of a better word. <laughs> and even before your whoop days, yes, <clears throat> you were yeah. very much into data and performance and brought those to your teams. And so, Brian, for you, when was kind Mm -hmm. of the transition? So I don't know how you go from special ops to entrepreneur in healthcare. I get the connection between, you know, growing up and seeing kind of the caregiver dilemma or Mm -hmm. the, the service sector and the sacrifice. But that's a big leap. I mean, yeah. go, going into, do, do you have prior entrepreneurial experience or? I actually did. Okay. Um, so I, I joined, you know, as I said earlier, I joined the military later, which um, is generally advantageous. I think anything older, you know, it, it, you just have more perspective. But I had, I had worked right. for about six years before I joined the military. And I think where that question, well, in, where it comes full circle for me. So, you know, the earlier question, I, and I'm thinking as we're talking, because I'm always, you know, fascinating by how we're creating our own stories. Mm-hmm. But part of it's, you know, definitely my mom had an indelible impact on my view of the world. And frankly, I think my view of myself, that confidence of unconditional love. But in high school, I, de- I definitely had a high school football coach who really helped me understand work ethic. I mean, that's what changed mm-hmm. my life. Um in the face of, I was not an exceptional athlete. I mean, I had to work e- extraordinarily hard to even play my senior year, which was a gift um, in retrospect. At the time, it was crippling. Um, but when I went you know, into college, a few things happened. I mean, um, you know, one, my mom passed when I was you know, fairly young. I was, I was a freshman in college. And that, mm. I think there's a certain focus, I mean, to your work on resilience. And we think, so, so that was in the backdrop. But I also had become very passionate about national security and, and, and the world. I grew up in a small town uh, and my mom was always encouraging me to travel because I think she, it was something she wished she had done. She was one of nine and, and you know pretty simple means in her family. And so I was, I was really amazed by the world. Uh, and you know, sort of serendipity being what it is, the summer after 9-11, I had an internship in the White House. Mm. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I had a front row seat to history. It was an insane time to be learning. And from there, I went over to the Pentagon. And the reason those two things are relevant to my work now um, is is a a series of things happened. The first is I started to see how large-scale 20th century institutions struggle with change. Because really, 9-11 was a watershed moment for our country on many levels into the 21st century. And so I learned about how leaders... How do you deal with complexity and change? And I was I was very much observing, but I was learning a lot. 
uh, unbeknownst to me at the time. Simultaneously, I think the other really seminal event for me, I had constantly been thinking about joining the military and I didn't have the courage to make that decision because I was older. My brother was younger. My brother was serving. It was part of it. And it was always something in my heart that I wanted to do. Um, you know, I, I read the book, The Alchemist, which was for me very influential. Um, but I have, I would say that some of the greatest advice we get in life, I think comes from strangers. When I break down like these moments where a stranger who has really no skin in the game of my own story just gives me an observational. Huh. Um, and so I was yeah. in London. I just finished graduate school. I was thinking about going into the military. I was in an interview for a job. And it's, I always say that, you know, I, I like to think I'm reasonably uh, socially aware and or have emotional intelligence to know, like at the end of an interview, it wouldn't make sense to say that I was interested in something else. But for some reason I did. And I, I knew this guy had been in the military. And I said to him, hey, I, I'm thinking about going into special operations. And he looked at me and he said, Brian, I promise you, if that's something you want to do, until you go do it, you'll be inherently dissatisfied with everything you do in your life. Wow. Mm. And it was like the cold, honest answer I needed. And it is a mirror. Hmm. And as a result, I made the decision to leave, you know, a reasonably flourishing career to go take that risk. And for me, that was a change. It, it, it changed my life because when I went and did that, everything thereafter for the next 10 years was one of the greatest chapters of my life. And it was so about cool. understanding, listening to your heart and what you want to do and taking right. risk. And so when I left the military now, I think it's the confluence of all that of like healthcare is a complex institution that's trying to do the same thing that def the Department of Defense was after 9-11. Right, right. And for me, it was, I knew I wanted to be drawn into an industry where I could be around people who were mission driven and service mm -hmm. archetypes. Well, I'm going to build on that because you were sharing with me earlier that it's structurally set up to burn people out. Mm -hmm. You know, the design, it's just not design for the complexity and the demands, mm -hmm. just like the military had to learn yeah. that its structure. So what did you see that was the connection between the military and healthcare in terms of that challenge? I th I, I've come to believe that all of the institutional architectures in our society that are built to serve society that we rely upon, you know, whether that's our education system, our healthcare system, our government, they were built, as we were talking earlier, in the 19th and 20th century. And they worked very well at a time, uh, uh, you know, an industrial revolution where scalable efficiency was really what we were after. Mm. But in the world of technological advancement in the 21st century, they fall dramatically short. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. But, you know, after 9-11, you saw that, you know, as an example, we looked at the world and the military through a very simple geographic lens. So we broke the world up into six clean geographic regions. Hmm. Which in, during World War II, when you're in the Pacific theater or right. the European theater, that made right. sense. But in today's world, very few problems are geographically isolated. And 9-11, again, was sort of this, you know, one of many events, but that was the, the, the largest. And so in healthcare, we're seeing when you overlay technological advancement on these the simple institutions that were meant for a different time, it creates real stress on the system, but especially on the individual human because they're trying to manage the speed of change and technology while also existing in a bureaucracy that makes, makes the, make, it, it develops a natural friction. Mm. Wow. Boy, I could go down lots of rabbit trails mm. on that. Yeah. Mm. I was on a plane going from Minneapolis to Seattle and this young kid, I'll call him a kid, long hair, he's last person on, flops in with a backpack. And I thought, this guy's got to be a loser. And so I didn't, talk to him most of the way. And then as we're landing, I asked, what do you do? And he started talking to me. So he was with an advertising firm called Fallon McElligot. And he had the Nike and the Sony accounts. That Those were his. So he was flying out to Nike. And he was telling me that at that time, that a 15-year-old in Beijing had more in common with a 15-year-old in the U.S. than their parents. And he for the first time, I heard the whole word asynchronous, mm -hmm. like asynchronous warfare. Yeah. And it just got me seeing, you know, that yeah. structural disadvantage. Yeah. You grew up in the business that you're in. And when you started, what was the size of OFS? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, that would have been in 2002. So maybe... 80, 90 million. Um, How so many employees? At the time, probably about 800, 7, 800 employees. Okay. Uh, when we started, when my dad converted it in the 80s from residential commercial, we did 9 million a year. 
um, wow. and had uh, 400 employees. And there was a pretty profound story as a kid that stuck with me forever was that, um, you know, building a business or pivoting a business, he would tell you today, if he was sitting here, that if they had known what it was really going to cost, they would have never done it. But <laughs> once they were in, there was no way they were going back. And so it took him away a lot um, to develop and grow this business and get people to buy into it. And so I was asking one time, I said, well, why, why don't you come to my little league games? All my other friends' dads are there. And he said, well, you got to understand we have two families. We have the family at home, but then we have a work family. And that family is, you know, 400 employees. And if it's an average American family, you know, spouse and two kids, you're wow. talking about 1,600 people we're responsible yeah. for. And we got to put a roof over their head, food on their table, clothes on their back. So yeah. that was always really uh, a That's profound, cool. yeah. um, you know, thing that I actually I didn't appreciate. And it actually pissed me off when he told me because, I, you know, I'm a kid, right? I just wanted to be at my game. But later in life, it came full circle. Mm, wow. And it really, I think it impacted all of us kids in, in our work ethic and, and our drive to fill that big shadow that he and my grandparents leave. So estimate how many families or people that you guys influence or have direct responsibility now? Uh, I know 2,000 employees. Yeah, so if you do the same math. Seven, 8,000. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's a huge growth. Was there a particular time when you saw the business just take a step change in terms of the direction, the quality, uh, the the complexity, the kind of go to market, or was it just kind of continuing to grow over time? No, I think all businesses go through those cycles where you you grow to plateau and then it takes a catalyst to grow again and then you eventually plateau and you got to keep uh, injecting something new to keep that going. Um, you know, it's it. It actually kind of reminds me of what we were just talking about around kind of the difference in in flexibility and agility. Um, I was having a pretty um, heated debate with a uh, now as a friend of mine. He's a, we were doing some work at Purdue University, and he he later shared his resume, which he was the chief supply chain architect for Jeff Bezos when they started Amazon. I didn't know that when I was arguing with the guy, but you know. <laughs> He was telling me that you're not flexible, you might be agile. And I, I, I didn't agree with the definition. And he said, agility is the ability to move in the moment laterally with a client. But flexibility requires the ability for the entire system to change in a dramatic um, outside uh, influence. So uh, economic mm -hmm. downturn or explosive growth. And unfortunately, he won the argument when reality hit with the Great Recession, right? And it proved, you know, you got to be able to uh, kind of let your organization breathe with demand. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's jump to January of 2020. Mm -hmm. And I'll pick up on where Ryan is. And Ryan, the pandemic had just a bone chilling effect on the office furniture industry, architecture design, because nobody came to the office. So all projects are on hold. What was going on? When did it first hit you? And and this is all about resilience and leadership. So what did you discover? When did you wake up? I know exactly where we were when I first heard about it. We were in Corpus Christi having spring break and I go to the grocery <laughs> store and there's no milk, uh, there's no toilet paper, but the oat milk was still there. And mm -hmm. so oat milk has a branding problem. That was my conclusion. <laughs> but that was the first time In I started. California, that wouldn't have been the case. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Well, yeah. this was Corpus Christi, yeah. Texas. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, I'm, so we were clueless. And I'm thinking, no big deal. A couple of weeks, we'll be out of this. And then all of a sudden, within six weeks, every single engagement I had for the year was gone. So I imagine. Wow. Now, you've got a lot of people to take care of. It's just me to scramble. But what was going on, and how did you guys respond? Uh, yeah, so um, I was sharing a little bit of this earlier, but the um, it was clear. It was a, it was a tour of designers um, that were in from Florida. They were all, you know, under the age of 35. And you could see as they were getting their coffees, getting ready to uh, head back to catch a plane, you could just see this worry and panic and fear in their faces. I mean, it was palpable. Yeah. And I guess maybe because of age, you know, that I've seen a couple cycles by now. I mean, I've seen the Y2K, I've seen the Great, you know, the Great Recession, um, you know, and, and we're in Southern Indiana where we were a little insulated from how severe it was on the coast at that point. 
um, I, we had a real epiphany in the moment that this was bigger than we realized. And, and so ran up, you know, stairs and, and got with our uh, head of communications or head of marketing. We sat down and we created a framework uh, built on a sense of calm, hmm. a, silt, a sense of confidence and a sense of context. And the reason we built those three pillars of communication was number one, we had to get everybody just to stop worrying, to be okay, because um, nobody had ever gone through this before, but we knew, you know, we our leadership team was the same team that went through those previous cycles. So we we had a lot of more tools in our toolkit than we did before. Uh, so to, to create a kind of a been there, done that sense of calm, even though we didn't have the answers and people want certainty, if they can't have certainty, you gotta provide clarity. And I think mm. we try to do that as much as possible. Context for us was big uh, because there was so much misinformation swirling out there. I mean, all con- it, the more sensational, the faster it traveled. And we said, hey, listen, don't even turn your TVs on. Let us filter the good from the bad and really kind of create a real sense of, of reality here. And then in, from there, we tried to instill a sense of confidence that no matter what, we were going to get through it. And we did things that at the time seemed kind of simple, but I think at the end were, uh, had a huge impact where we did guaranteed incomes. So, you know, if you're a salesperson, 100% of your income is at risk in commissions. And if nobody's coming to the office, how am I going to yeah. put food on the mm-hmm. table for my bills? So we immediately um, uh, did things like that, put these safety nets in place, and then we communicated a lot, and that's where Woot became a, a, a real tool because communication is exhausting when you're trying to pick the exact yeah. right words because there was so many other, you know, the social unrest and the different things. There was so much happening is, you know, communication for us was paramount. And um, you could see that in your strain scores. You could yeah. literally see, you, you know, at the end of the day. And I think you actually were the one that also taught us that the reason we get tired on Zoom is because there's an imperceptible disconnect between the audio and the visual and your brain's trying to reconcile that, but you don't even notice it happening. You're just completely taxed at the end. So, you know, we, you know, that was kind of, you know, as that whole thing came together and then we were trying to like, just keep everybody on task and we reframed them to get them to focus on other things. So said, Hey, if you're not selling, let's work on sales skills. Um, if there's people you can never get a hold of, pick up the phone and just start calling them because they should be available right now. And when we were able to open hmm. doors and create actually a whiplash of momentum coming out of the pandemic business-wise. Mm-hmm. And Kristen, for you, I've got two angles to look at this one is what was going on with whoop at the time, but all the data you were getting from people and what you were seeing. So let's break it into two first. Yeah. January, 2020 (laughs) you're in Boston. We had just, so I had been leading a sleep validation effort uh, for gosh, it started in 2017, I think. So these things take a very long time. (laughs) Um, But we finally got our third party sleep validation published in January of 2020 and one of the results was that respiratory rate was one breath um, of the gold standard. So super, super accurate. And what we ended up learning very quickly is that COVID, of course, is a lower respiratory tract infection. Right. And, you know, one of the markers that could, you know, moves around the most with a lower respiratory tract infection is your respiratory rate. So we had this incredible data around respiratory rate. Um, and we'd been tracking it for years, you know, I mean, it wasn't like we just added it, but we just weren't surfacing it to the, to the user or we weren't really using it for anyone, for anything other than modeling our sleep. Once we learned that uh, respiratory rate was kind of the canary in the coal mine, um, we started looking at our data. And the first thing that we did is we just pulsed our members with surveys just to find out if they had contracted COVID and if they got testing. And we just tried to collect as much data from them as humanly possible to contextualize the objective data that we're tracking. And, you know, sure enough, we saw that people were experiencing, you know, 17 to 20% spikes relative to their baseline uh, in respiratory rate. Um, And in fact, and those folks who were, you know, getting those spikes were also uh, also had COVID. Um, So we started working on an algorithm to uh, see if we could actually detect COVID um, prior to symptom onset. And we were able to develop an, ac- uh, an algorithm that was 80% accurate. Um, wow. So in detecting COVID three days prior to symptom onset. So it's pretty exciting. Um, so we use those data. And there's a story, a golf story. Yeah, with Nick Watney. Yeah, yeah. so this was so this is kind of once, I guess, well, COVID was still full on, but people were trying to get back to work. We're trying to get back to play. Um, and Nick Watney is a professional golfer. And he, uh, I think it was in, gosh, June of, 
or July of 2020. And they had, you know, all of these incredibly stringent measures in place to get everyone tested. And so the tournament started on a Thursday. He got tested on a Tuesday. And on the Tuesday, he tested negative uh, and then woke up Thursday morning and his whoop uh, indicated that he was, uh, you know, his respiratory rate was through the roof relative to his baseline. Right. And so he self-isolated, got tested, and he was uh, indeed wow. positive. And but what it ended up being, and I kind of similar to Brian in the sense that it ended up being this incredible blessing in that, you know, we were able to pretty reliably detect whether or not you have COVID. Mm -hmm. And it, at minimum, it just is an extra layer of protection on top of all these other measures right, that folks right. are taking. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the Nick story kind of led to a partnership with the PGA. Um, and, you know, we have widespread adoption right. um, golf globally. Um, and I think just the fact that, you know, COVID, I think, really shined this bright light on just health, you know, metabolic health and, um, and, you know, just being able to have more, have more understanding of actually what's happening with our body. And I, people started to look to trackers, you know, to, to yeah. better understand what is actually happening. And so I think for us, it ended up being a, a, a blessing, you know, for sure. Uh, and I, I think what we're really proud of is that we're able to contribute to, um, our scientific understanding of, of the disease. And um, I think we kept a lot of people safe and, you know, healthy. Uh, there's another study um, that we did with Dr. Chuck Seisler. He's a, a scientist out of uh, Brigham um, Women's. And uh, we actually looked at the three months of preprint. This is a mental health resilience story. Um, looking at three months of data pre-quarantine and then the three months of data post-quarantine. And what we were trying to, and we basically took a huge sample size. We pulsed them with surveys to get a sense of their baseline uh, psychological resilience or kind of mental health resilience. And what we saw is that individuals going into the quarantine um, that had the mo more stable sleep-wake times huh. actually were more, more physiological, physiologically and psychologically resilient. Wow. Um, post quarantine. So that it's kind of interesting. That is incredible. The data is insane. That. I mean, yeah. I think what's cool is that I, you know, I always say that I think the opportunity is really to reduce a lot of the noise that exists um, sure, in the industry sure, in terms right. of how do we actually apply our effort. And there's no question stabilizing your sleep wake time is, is a right. path to mental and physical um, yeah. health resilience. So I'd like you to share um, your first Whoop experience. You know, when you first got the app, why you put it on and um, and just kind of the awakening, what you, what you discovered and why you feel like, man, I've discovered something that's going to help me for a long time. And Brian, I'll start with you mm -hmm. on kind of your original WHOOP experience. It really was through our work in hospitals. I mean, I, I, had, okay. I had been uh, exposed to wearables prior to that and was per and on a personal front, I believe I always tell people that this idea of introspection Part of that comes through understanding our own data. Mm -hmm. And there's a fine line of getting, you know, obsessed with our data in a way that distracts life. But for me, it was a real game changer understanding some of the basic sleep architecture. And um, but it was the higher order reason that I've always looked at that, that you know, we've partnered with Whoop at Arena Labs is that first was just frankly, form factor. So, you know, for surgeons and nurses, it can be worn on the bicep. And so at the time we wanted to be able to collect data in the operating room or in the IC or ED. Yep. But more importantly, um, we were, uh, this is probably devious from the answer you're looking for, but one of the reasons that we've often loved Whoop is that from a brand perspective, they have a little bit more edge and we call swagger. And the reason that's important is that we wanna remind people in healthcare, we're, we're, we're looking to get people in healthcare to think of themselves like elite athletes or military personnel yeah, or creatives like where there's that. a real investment. Yeah. And so having something that does, it's, it can't be too evocative to say, look, you're LeBron James. That's just a Delta that people can't. But when it, when people are reminded through imagery and experience that is, this is an investment in you and understanding yourself, it's powerful. Uh, and so we had used a lot of other sensors previously, form factor, et cetera. And, and it, what it came down to was that we were looking for a partner that had the right brand that would energize people in the front lines of healthcare. And, and yeah. Yeah. When I was doing research on the healthy workplace nudge, I actually wrote a chapter that included the corporate or the cognitive athlete because of what I was learning with whoop. And, um, uh, I first bought a whoop in 2016. I was reading about Roger Federer and LeBron mm -hmm. James getting all this sleep 
12 hours at some points and started doing research on um, on different levels of uh, fatigue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started reading about that and wondering if that's something, a phenomenon here. When I first got it, it I started using it and I thought, I'm fit. You know, I get up early in the morning. You know, I was going to bed 10, 30, 11, getting up 5, 30 or 6, working out every day. And then bought the whoop and I was in the red all the time. I'm thinking this thing's broken. Mm -hmm. So I returned it. And then I said, I'm going to get to the source. And that's when I reached out to Kristen and <laughs> said, what's up with this thing? And then got it back. And I was in denial, which mm -hmm. a lot of people are yeah. in the process. And then slowly the feedback for me was just mm -hmm. seeing and then asking myself, well, what did I do last night that mm -hmm. caused the green? Or what yeah. did I do last night that hit hit me hard? And over time, radically changed my life, my habits, and my appreciation mm. for this. And uh, I became a little bit like, um, who's the kid in Sixth Sense that sees dead people? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I started seeing people and say, oh, they didn't get a good night's sleep. Yeah. I can just tell. Yeah, <laughs> so you get amazing. this, you can see the energy and yeah. you can see the vibe. Now, Ryan, for you, I kind of know where the origin story was, but what was your first kind, your first month's experience with the Whoop? What well, did you I mean, think? you were the origin story. I know. So. That's why I say I know <laughs> the should. origin story. Um, and what was that? Where you, you said, hey, you got to... Well, one of his employees, a yeah. yeah. uh, young man by the name of James Reed, he's not a young man anymore, but I knew him when he was a young man, and, and, uh, but he was using it. He worked for Ryan. I don't know if he talked you mm -hmm. into it. Yeah, he probably talked you into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah he talked me into it. And I was kind of early in my midlife crisis we were talking about <laughs> uh, in my fitness journey. And and I was tracking everything like in spreadsheets. I still do. I've got every workout since, I don't know, 2018 wow. uh, that I've done. Because I'd really like to know where I'm at in my yeah. fitness journey physically. Yeah. and But I didn't have anything to track, you know, what was going on in my body internally. And, and I read... Um, Matt Walker, I think, uh, mm. book, Why We Sleep. Right. And that really kind of shook me to my core because, you know, where we, where we're from, and I guess, and, and how we've been conditioned is we get up early. I mean, I was always mm. a 4, 4.30 uh, a.m. kind of guy. And and it was actually kind of, my persona actually revolved around that a bit. Right, you know, being, yeah, being that, that, right. Like, we're able to make that, then you realize how irrational that is in some ways. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. When you're doing it just to say you do it. Yeah. yeah you, and then, the but you don't and know. Then you realize. Yeah. yeah it was yeah. like a badge of yeah. honor. Yeah. yeah. Unless you're going to yeah. bed at seven. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and that wasn't work. And, uh, and then, you know, but I tell you the reason I love it. And I tell everybody this, that, that, that I talk to it, cause I've tried pretty much all of them. It's passive. Mm -hmm. I don't need something else in my life that's beeping and dinging and buzzing and, you know, just flashing. I just want something that's there. And when I want to interact with it, I do. I go to my phone. Mm. It's, it's literally the first thing I do every morning. I hit process now, go get my cup of coffee. I know I'm supposed to push that off a little later, according to Andrew Huberman, but we're, it's, it's a work in progress, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But <laughs> I go and kind of see what I, you know, what the strain and recovery looks like and then try to kind of dissect that a little bit, record it and then go on. But for, you know, for me, it's, it's the, it's the empirical data that that either supports good behavior or mm -hmm. it points mm -hmm. out the bad behavior that you need to work on. So it's yeah. uh, I I love yeah. it just because it's it's passive, but yet it gives me so, it's so rich in the data yeah. and information. But it's when I want to interact mm -hmm. with it. In my environment, we call that the principle of non neutrality. There are no <laughs> neutral choices. It's either going to upgrade performance or it's going to downgrade. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, I think it's yep. Yeah. <laughs> and you compound those every day. Yeah, choices add up. Yeah, and it does. They either serve you, they it, don't. And part of my motivation when I started, so I'm, I started my health turnaround at 46. You know, I was 195 pounds, stressed. Wow. The crash, the economic crash, near bankruptcy. My Gosh. wife will tell you I wasn't the best husband. She's Aww. right back there. To, and, <laughs> you know, and so had to turn around through all of that. And... And then I started seeing my peers. I started noticing their weight or their fatigue or whatever and their habits and then seeing parents. And I said, I'm, you know, I projected 20 years out and said, I want to be in a different place 20 years from now. Mm. Um, so that was part of my turnaround part as well. And so I can't have a group of really high performing people without knowing what's What's the current thing you're reading or thinking about 
that really gets you excited. If you wanted to pass along, hey, you need to read this book, or this is somebody you need to listen to, who would it be? Yeah, I mean, I love Peter Sterling's work. Okay. Um, he's, a, he's a neuroscientist, and I think his explanations of resilience um, and mm. um, you know, functional adaptation versus maladaptive ad- ad- adaptation, yeah. um, are, I think, are brilliant and really consumable. Um, so I, I would point people to Peter Ster- Sterling's work. Okay. Yeah. Brian, how about for you? Uh, I'm going to like wildly sort of reframe the question for convenience, but I've go. got sort of three buckets <laughs> I'm thinking about. So, so one is um, to the conversation we had earlier, I think every person in today's world is struggling with stress in some way. Yeah. Right. Um, and so the, the two books that were really helpful for me, one is uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky. We talked about mm-hmm. the car, fairly right. dense work, but uh, just in general, Sapolsky's work around understanding stress and yeah. how to move through it. Um, and then Besser van der Kolk, The Body Keeps sure. the Score. Both yep. of those, I just think, um, understanding stress at a deeper level. Yeah. Uh, and those are just front of mind, I think, from our That's conversation. Right. The second is, I think, in people then say, okay, what do I do about this? Um, and uh, his name's already come up in the car, and you just brought him up. But Andrew Huberman, who mm-hmm. is a science advisor to, I think, about everyone now, um, <laughs> but certainly for Whoop and it, for us at Arena. And then Chris and I work with him through uh, the Liminal Collective, which is a performance organization. But Andrew's podcast it's phenomenal for tactical insights on hmm. how do I manage stress? How do I improve sleep? And then the last one I'll say is we're all thinking about time and how do we spend time when it feels increasingly fleeting in the fast paced world mm-hmm. of the 21st century. And there's a book called 4,000 weeks. Um, oh yeah. And it 4,000 weeks is the average amount of weeks in a human life. Right. Um, and it is phenomenal. It's almost a modern stoic take on how to yes. think about time management yes. and living a flourishing life. And that's also just front of mind. So it's a way longer answer than I you read asked, but... that book. I calculated how much time I have left on the planet. Oh. I extended it because <laughs> I'm following uh, Dr. Roy, uh, Dr. Royzen's Living Younger. Yeah. So I think, mm-hmm. okay, I'm going to give myself an extra 10 years over that 4,000 weeks. But I showed it to my kids. Yeah. And it said, oh, my goodness. And it's by Oliver it's Berkman. It's sobering. But, yeah. And, and in fairness, I do think you said earlier when you, know, you were 46 – But what's interesting about that, I think I always say there's never been a better time to be alive in many ways. And one is that we now have these devices where we can make choices decades earlier than than we ever understood before. And that does allow an extension. So, Ryan, I know you've read Tempered Resilience, but is... Is that kind of the top one on the list, or do you have another one? You know, that's a phenomenal book on leadership. I think everybody should read it. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's so well written. The metaphors are so strong, and I've referred everybody to it. Um, You know, I think you can go to Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Mm -hmm. Frankl, right? I think Mm -hmm. that actually, that book um, gave a sense of context for me through the entire Mm -hmm. pandemic. I mean, you, Mm -hmm. I mean... It was just so framing or reframing yeah. of the situation that we were finding ourselves in, and and I I, I loved it. Um, Comfort crisis is another one that I, that's uh, phenomenal. We were talking about boredom earlier mm-hmm. uh, in the car ride, and and how we just don't have any of it anymore. And he he goes into depth on that and why getting out in nature in these you know back country and, and his in particular is a hunt uh, in Alaska, but just we don't have enough boredom in our lives Mm -hmm. and we don't have enough time and space to just Mm -hmm. think, um, instead of just getting stuff shoved down our throat. Um, natural born heroes was another one that I absolutely love by, uh, Chris McDougal. He wrote, um, what born to run. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, uh, it's, it's, it's half history lesson, but half kind of human potential. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, it's a, a really phenomenal read. Um, yeah, I'd say those are the ones that are kind of top of my. Actually, right. Alchemist is in my in my briefcase right now, so uh, that's my, that's I love my reading it. material for tomorrow. We so. could spend the whole time. Just, uh, we could just <laughs> do that kind yes. of thing. Yeah. Yes.